Good morning. Welcome to our Bible study this morning. This morning we'll be looking at lesson number 13, the final lesson in our series, The Importance of the Local Church. <clears throat> For today's lesson, I would like this simply to be a summary type of lesson. We'll just go over a few of the basic principles we've looked at in the past lessons, as well as trying to put everything together and summarizing a few truths about the Lord's Church that I think are really important to emphasize once again. <clears throat> Keep in mind, over the past 13 weeks we've been looking at the importance of the local church and here's some of the things that we looked at. <clears throat> Basically the reason why the local church is important to us as Christians is for three basic reasons. The nature of the local church, the mission of the local church, and some other miscellaneous truths we looked at about the local church. Those three were the basic headings we looked at. Keep in mind, it, <clears throat> in every case, when it came to the local assembly, the one thing that made it stand out from all other assemblies is it has God's authority behind it. It's been chosen by God. It's been selected by God. It's been formed by God. It's been created by God. For the specific purpose of his worship and the fulfillment of the Great Commission. So that's really important for us to understand, folks. If there's ever a reason for Christians to join a local assembly and serve in a local assembly, right there you've got it. It's the house of worship that God has chosen. Its main job is to keep the Great Commission. What more reason would we want? <clears throat> As we look back at all the different areas of study concerning the local church, something else stood out. Everything that the local church does, whether we're talking about the content of its teaching, whether we're talking about its practices, whether we're talking about the different offices in that church, whether we're talking about the membership in general, <clears throat> there should be a united effort to do what? To glorify the Lord, to honor the Lord, to serve the Lord, to put him first, and to do things his way. If you would turn me please to Ephesians chapter 3, we find that very principle in Ephesians 3, 20 and 21. What is the greatest goal that a local church should have. Listen to what Ephesians 3, 20 and 21 says. <clears throat> now unto him that is able to do us, us exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that worketh in us. So here's the idea. Unto God, who is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think. You know, we can let our imaginations run wild thinking about what God is capable of doing. He can do even more. And he can do that according to the power that's working in us. What is that power working in us? It's the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> so folks, when we go out and serve the Lord, we are empowered by the Holy Spirit. Do you know that same power that we have within us? that is under the sovereign control of the Lord, that same power is able to do more than we could ever imagine. You may have a friend or a family member, for example, that is lost. <clears throat> and it seems like every possible attempt you've made to share with them the truth has been rejected flat out. It almost seems hopeless, doesn't it? Do you know what this verse teaches us? God is able. And he can use the spirit in us to accomplish that task. So by us consistently living godly lives in front of those people who are lost, <clears throat> if it's God's will, it's possible for him to use us to bring those people to Christ, even though they may seem like that nobody can reach them. With God, all things are possible. 
Unto Him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus, throughout all ages, world without end. Amen. Through the intercession of Jesus Christ in the midst of the assembly, God is given the glory and the honor. What's that basically saying? <clears throat> God is glorified through the teaching of truth, and God is glorified through the practices that are scriptural. How does a church teach the truth? It's only through the enabling grace of Christ. How does a church practice that which is prescribed in God's word? It's only through the enabling grace of Christ. By Christ's intervention, based upon his death on the cross and the blessings that, throw, that flow from that death, <clears throat> the local church is given the ability to please God and to do what is pleasing to him to the point he is honored and he is glorified. <clears throat> so the advice that I give to every local assembly is this. <clears throat> Pastor, you need to desire one thing above all else, and that is for God to be glorified. If you desire for God to be glorified, the truth will be taught. The scriptural practices that God desires in your church will take place. He'll be honored and glorified in it all. For members, what should be your great desire in the local church? For God to be glorified. <clears throat> that means you too will speak the truth to others around you because you know that's what glorifies God. And you'll be living a, a holy life around others as well, knowing, once again, God is glorified in it. <clears throat> if every member of a local church is unified in their desire to glorify God above all else, everything else just kind of falls into place. The problem is we get other things in the way of that. Pride sometimes stands in the way of glorifying God. <clears throat> A misunderstanding of scripture gets in the way of glorifying God. False teaching gets in the way of glorifying God. There's many things that Satan tries to use to stand in the way of God being honored and glorified in a local church like he should be. But if a church is resolute in saying, we want to glorify God above all else, and if they stick to that, I'm telling you, in the end, the truth will be taught and scriptural practices will take place in that assembly. In Matthew 16, <clears throat> I'm sorry, Matthew 18, verse 20. One more text I would like us to look at in this lesson, then we'll close. Matthew 18, 20. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. Okay, <clears throat> here we find a very precious truth. All it takes are two or three people gathered together in the name of the Lord, and he promises to be right in the middle of things. He promised to, to be actively working in the midst of that assembly. All it takes are two or three to be gathered in, the midst, in, in his name. I'd like to point out several things about this verse before we go any further. First of all, the idea of being gathered together. If you study the idea of being gathered together, it means to be led or to be brought together. It doesn't simply mean, ah, you have some Christians who decide to get together. That's not what that means. When gathered together, it means to be led by the Spirit, <clears throat> to be brought together. When the Spirit is in this assembly, where the Spirit's the one that calls this assembly, the Spirit is the one that moves in the hearts of these Christians, bringing them together, you have something special going on. That's what it means to be <clears throat> gathered together. It means to be led together. Next, I would like us to notice the idea of being in the midst. Where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. 
the idea meant to be, it means to be right in the middle of things, like I tried to explain just a, just a few seconds before this. The idea that the Lord is saying He's going to be active <clears throat> in what takes place in that meeting. He's going to be right in the middle of things, if I can put it that way. <clears throat> So again, we're not just talking about the Lord being present. We're talking about the Lord being active in what takes place in that assembly. But finally, the other important point is these people were gathered in the name of Christ. Where two or three are gathered together in my name. <clears throat> What's it mean to be gathered in his name? It's the idea to be meeting together with a desire to fulfill God's will. Doing things God's way is doing it in His name. So it's not, well, we're going to come together in the name of Christ, but now we're going to do our own thing. No, we're coming together to meet in Christ's name, wanting to do what Christ wants us to do. That's what it means to gather together in His name. <clears throat> so what we have here is this when the spirit moves in the hearts of Christians and brings them together into an assembly and when their attitude in that assembly is they want to do things the way God wants them done he promises to be actively intervening in that assembly He promises to be gracing them. He promises to be active in their midst. He promises to, to be with them, working on their behalf. That's what that verse is teaching. Now, what I would like us to understand is this as well. <clears throat> I know that many of us look at that verse and we, we don't in our minds begin to think of that as a verse talking about a local assembly you know a local church we just talk, think about that as Christians getting together but what's important is to recognize the context of this verse because I believe the context shows us clearly this is talking about a local assembly first of all stop and think about it. we've already seen this is the result of the spirit moving in their hearts bringing them together once they get together, we saw they have an intense desire to only do what God wants them to do. And thirdly, then, we saw the idea is, at that point in time, Christ would be actively at work in their midst. Okay, I guess just based on that, sure, it could be Christians getting together, but we also have to admit it could be a local assembly being talked about, because all of those three principles apply to a local assembly. There certainly, local assemblies are certainly made up of people whom the Lord has led to get together and form that assembly and then join that assembly. Certainly, the Lord's church is an a organization that will then decide what? To put the Lord first and to do things the way he wants them done. And certainly, and the Lord is actively in the midst of his local churches working on their behalf. So, these can apply to a local church as well. So, I guess to start with, I want us to understand these things can be talking about a local assembly. How do we know which? How do we know if it means just believers getting together or if we're talking about a real local assembly, a local church meeting? Notice the context. Back in Matthew 18, 15 through 17, here we're talking about how to deal with sin, now get this, that has entered the local assembly. This is not talking about sin entering into a group of Christians that just decide to meet together. This is a local assembly and how they should deal with that. Listen to this. In Matthew 18, 15 through 17, this is just two verses prior to the verse we looked at. Moreover, if any brother shall trespass against thee, go and tell him his fault between thee and him alone. If he hear thee, thou hast gained thy brother. But if he will not hear thee, then take one or two more, that the mouth of two or three witnesses every word may be established. If he shall neglect to hear them, tell it unto the church. We're talking about two church members that are having a dispute. They're to go and meet with one another first to try to settle it. If not, if it can't be settled, then you're supposed to take two or three witnesses with you. And again, 
approach this person and try to settle the issue. If that can't be done, then you're supposed to take it to the church. But if he neglect to hear the church, let him be unto thee as a heathen man and a publican, meaning he then is removed from the church assembly because of willful, rebellious sin that he's not willing to get right with the Lord and with the assembly. That is clearly a local church dealing with sin in its midst between two members. So, within just two or three verses of the text we're looking at, we're clearly talking about a local assembly. But watch the next two verses in 18 and 19. Verily, or truly, I say unto you, whatsoever ye shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatsoever ye loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Now, folks, that's right in the context of this church discipline. And the idea is this. When you remove that person out of your assembly... Whoever you loose on earth, when you loose them from the assembly, they're loosed in heaven too, meaning what? The Lord recognizes the discipline that has just taken place. And the Lord too will deal with him as if he was a heathen man and a publican. So in other words, the Lord's going to stand behind the church's decision. If it's done in the right way, the Lord's going to stand behind this church's decision. If the church brings about restor restitution and restoration on, on the part of this man. Instead of casting him out, the man does repent. Whoever shall bind on earth shall be bound to him. The Lord will recognize that as well. And he'll look upon that person as if he has repented and, re and restore him to a good standing before the Lord as well. So the idea of that verse is whatever decision the local church makes concerning this man that's being disciplined, the Lord will stand behind that decision and recognize that individual in the same way that the church is recognizing him. Again, I say unto you that if two of you agree on earth touching anything that they shall ask, it shall be done for them of my Father which is in heaven. The great authority the Lord has given <clears throat> to his assembly to discipline church members and the great authority he's given to his local assembly in times of prayer, when the assembly meets together in prayer, desiring for the Lord's will to be done. He'll honor that. But clearly, folks, you have to see, there's no doubt in the context of verse number 20, the verses leading up to that are clearly talking about a local church meeting. How to discipline sin and prayer in a local church meeting. The great authority the Lord gives to that church for both of those different forms of service to the Lord. Then we get down to four, where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. Why is it the Lord recognizes church discipline? Because when you got two or three gathered together in his name, he's right there working in their midst. As that disciplinary proceeding is going on, he's working in their midst, bringing that to pass. <clears throat> why is it when a church meets together in prayer? Why will the Lord honor that in a special way? Because where two or three are gathered together in his name, there is he in the midst of them, working right in their midst during that prayer time. Do you see how these verses go together, folks, to clearly illustrate for us the fact the local church is a very special organization. It's a very special, it's the very body of Christ that Christ will meet in their midst, he'll work in their midst, he'll bring about in a local assembly a special level of worship that cannot be had by simply individual Christians worshiping the Lord outside the assembly. Once again, I want to thank you so much for joining me in this study on the importance of the local church. Again, if you have any questions, please feel free to either leave comments on my text blog or email me. My email address is settledinheaven at gmail.com. <clears throat> I'll try to answer any questions that I possibly can. But I just ask once again, folks, that as we finish up this study, please take your time to think back over what we've looked at over the past 13 weeks and realize how very important the Lord's local assembly is to all of us who are believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. May the Lord bless you as you study his word.